spoken lately. I haven't thought about flying for a long time. I have a dream that at that moment when I was alone above the clouds for a long time. I have dreamed of waking up in a room surrounded in blue and green grass for more years than I could dream of memory. I have a walked back into the past or scratched on the doors of my origins, where it all came from, just to hold up that cape for the last time. Return to Kent Town 10th year anniversary edition is a revised version of Andy N's first poetry book. The book can be purchased from Amazon and it contains numerous additional material. Spoken Label Hi, it's Andy N from Spoken Label. Thank you today for streaming or downloading another episode of Spoken Label. Spoken Label was originally set up on the beginning of the 2016 and as of speaking has currently nearly 300 sessions. The full archive is available on Spoken Label full stop bandcamp.com although it is available for free for stream and download if you wish. I am always grateful for any sort of kind of donation to enable me to keep the running costs of this podcast going. And enjoy. Take care. Bye-bye. Spoken Label. Hey guys, Andy N. Spoken Label. Back in the house on a Sunday. It's been an erratic day today. We've had literally rain and showers on and off all day. So, But less of the weather reports. On to the poetry. And we have a special guest to us today. And this lady is a tour de force uh, her agent, who I've dealt with before, I'm not going to name, so I'll make up the met the lady blush. I send her several arises to me now, and she's some, a real who to me today. And I'm delighted to have Lynn Thompson with us today, the ex-poet laureate of obviously LA, and she's brought out an amazing book, Blue on a Blue Palette. Now, Lynn, obviously, we've got a lot of ground I want to talk to you today about this book and also about yourself as well. So give us... The background about your creativity, first of all, where it all came from. That started first. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be with you and your listeners. Um, my background as a writer was a somewhat um, a windy path, but it began with my father, who was an avid reader and particularly of poetry and read me poetry as a young girl and really got me to love that art and to start scribbling my own very horrible childlike poems at a young age. And then I went um, to law school, went to college and followed it up with law school. And that completely killed the time I needed to write, to think about it, et cetera. I was completely focused on my legal career. And then one day I woke up and said, you know, the thing that's wrong with your life is that you're not creating, you're not really satisfying that that bug of poetry that was planted in you so long ago. And so I shifted from my career as a litigator, I think that would be a barrister in England, either, I always get mixed up barrister or a, um, what the other term is, but Um, walked away from that and went to work at the University of California in Los Angeles. And even though that that was a demanding job, it wasn't, it was demanding in a different way, I'll say. And that allowed me more time to learn about poetry. I didn't want to go back to, to school. I had just paid off my school debt. So I wasn't interested in getting in debt again, but really went on a journey to do everything outside of the academy that I could to develop as a poet. And it's been just an amazing path and has worked out pretty well for me. Really? Yes, yeah, understandable. Cause I, so people will see this book and come on to your book in a few moments' time. Now, obviously, before we get onto that, we have to make people aware, obviously, you were the LA Poet Laureate from 2021 to 2022. Now, I've, I've chatted to various poet laureates in various countries as well, and I'm really keen on learning about your experience on this role. So first of all, then, tell us about how you applied for this, first of all. So my journey and those of poet laureates across the world at the time that I was appointed was interesting because I applied in early, uh, let's say, February of 2020, 
the plan being to name a poet laureate during National Poetry Month, April. Well, in between those two things, a little pesky pandemic popped up, shut everything down all over the world. And frankly, I forgot about it. The following January, I got get an email and I, I'm thinking it's a joke. It's one of those jokes that you get an email, not such a joke, an email that says, you know, I'm lost in London, please send $10,000. You know, I thought it was something in that category, but it turned out that it was not, that it was true that the mayor at the time, Mayor Garcetti, had selected me as the poet laureate for a two year stint. The problem was most poet, poet laureates would go into the schools and into senior centers and to libraries and so forth. Well, things were still raging with the pandemic. We did not yet have the vaccinations. Um, so everyone was hunkered down at home. So the, the trick was to try to figure out how to be in the role, be a representative for the city in that role. And so I did a couple of things. I started a podcast, a weekly podcast, where I would discuss and read the poems of other poets, not myself, but of others. And I also started trying to plan events in schools and libraries in particular over Zoom. I don't know what we would have done as a society on this planet if we hadn't had Zoom to connect us because oh, God, we, were, yeah. we were just, yeah, we were disconnected from one another. And that was a challenge. The second year things opened up a little bit more. And even though a lot of people still felt uh, a little concerned about going out, but, but we were starting to go out a little bit more during the second year of my uh, term as poet laureate. So that helped, but that first year was pretty tough. And it wasn't just me, anyone who was in that or a similar role had that challenge. How do I make this work in a world that is suffering in the way that it is? Yeah, understandable. Did you other than just, had you used Zoom before lockdown? Had you? Because I used it twice, but very loosely. Yes, I, I fortunately, I knew a little bit about it. I'm still not the most technologically astute person, but I had uh, been serving on a board at my alma mater, Scripps College. And in fact, I was the chair of the board also during the pandemic. So this was a double whammy. And in order for us to have our board meetings, we had to conduct them over Zoom since it was no longer an option to meet in person like we would normally do. So I had some facility with it, but I, I still don't feel that I'm an expert, but I did have enough to, to get that off the ground. I think I'd use it twice, Tom, I will submit with you, because I've got a friend of mine that now lives near Five B, but he was in Texas, and he introduced me to it about a month before, before everything went berserk. So when it happened, me and my wife, like, we're both thinking, well, this one, I know a bit about it, and I told her then. And it definitely kept us going. And in a way, Lynn, it was very helpful to me, because it looked, going on to this like we are now, it's made using that spoken label, which is chatting today, a lot more smoother sailing for me, chat people like yourself, so... Yeah, it's yeah. been helpful. It's been, it's helpful it's been helpful in some ways, definitely. <laughs> in many ways, it's been helpful. Thank, thank goodness we we had that technology. Otherwise, it really it was already very difficult. But at least you could see family, you could see friends, and that that certainly helped a lot. Oh, yeah, completely. Now on to poetry, of course. Now I'm just just in, I'm just digressing, which is me all over, really. <laughs> now yes. Yes. to date, obviously, you've done four poetry books. I've not yes. read the first three. Oh, hands up. Well, I've read the fourth one. We'll talk about it in a few moments. But you've done three already, and I know they are. Beg no pardon. Start with a small guitar and threat work. Now, I want to learn about these three books, because I've said before to your account of Mike that I'm always believing in every book you write, it's a reaction to the previous book. So there is, is there a progressive leap from each one book to the other, do you find, looking back at these now? Yeah, I, I do think there are connections. The first book was really um, a book about family and a, a kind of an introducing myself to the world. I'm an adoptee, so I wanted to write about that a little bit. My parents were immigrants from the Caribbean, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I wanted to write about that a little bit. 
Um, and then I had some miscellaneous poems about relationships that I think fed into the second book, Start With a Small Guitar, which a poet friend of mine calls my love, no love book. Um, and all of those were love poems in some form or another. The third book, I reverted a little bit to family and really kind of brought the themes of family and love together in that book. And this fourth book really went a little bit more afield. I, I didn't want a book where I talked about myself really or did so very minimally as compared to the other books. So when I was putting it together and realized I had all of these poems about women, our histories, our joys, our rages, our frustrations, our bodies, our spirituality, our aging, um, particularly in a time when certainly in the US and around the planet, the rights that women thought they had acquired and were permanent seemed to be chipped away at. So not only seem to be are in fact being minimized and marginalized and in many cases just obliterated altogether. So I really wanted to not necessarily hammer those points, but to talk about what I call the plight of women on the planet as we attempt to navigate the many challenges that we face um, as women. So that was that was really the motivating force. And just by chance, as I went through the poems, I also found that they focused that so many of them referenced either the color blue or the concept of the blues as we know it in music. And so I decided to highlight those as well in the collection. Yes. So Go there's on. there's probably some of the, 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 the reliable sources that I like. I like to look to history. Uh, I like to look to travel beyond borders, that sort of thing. Those themes recur in all of the books. But this one is, is a little bit going a little bit more deeply into something beyond myself and my experiences and my observations to, to really focus on what I think is a very troubled period for women. Yes. Now, the book itself, I said, 40 years, there's a lot, lot of characters in, in this book. And someone I knew, I had to go and research a couple of these as well. So... That's why I like a good challenge show. Now, you told me, obviously, off mic before, the original this book started to come together, didn't it, really, when you were when you were poet laureate? But it was a bit of an accidental book, really, wasn't it, as well? You weren't planning for this to be a book for you originally, were you, at all? Not at all. Not at all. I just... But I was continuing to write, and I think that many, many poets find that even though they may think they're writing about a butterfly they're really writing about something else so that when they sit down and look maybe at several years of poems, they start to see the themes emerge in those poems. So I, I, I was very grateful that there, there were enough poems to put together a collection given that I wasn't working on a particular project. I think sometimes when you're doing books, and I, I'm guilty of this one myself before now as well, is sometimes books sneak up in you sometimes. You don't realise, do you, to a certain stage of it. So I've done that twice now, and book I'm currently writing is at that stage where I wrote 15, 20 poems in about, what, two years, and I realised, I thought, oh, I'm going to make this a female. So, yeah, I can relate to what you're on about here. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Now, and it's such a wonderful surprise when that happens. Oh, yeah, completely. Now, obviously, in the book itself, and like people know when I get given books as previews, I go and do a deep dive. So we're going to talk about seven or eight of these poems now. Ones I, well, I enjoyed all of it, but just some I want to talk about. Now, at sure. the, begin the beginning of the book to start with, there's a couple of quotes from Cornelius yes. Eady and Dion Brand. Now, I'm not going to read the so. quotes out, so many people will look at them in the book themselves. But yes. what made you want to put these quotes at the beginning of the book? I think with the exception of Start With a Small Guitar, all of my books begin with an epigraph. And I think of them kind of as the base 
that will support what's to come afterwards. And it's a way I often, you may have noticed in these poems, pay tribute to other creative people that I admire and who have influenced me in my work. So in choosing Cornelius and Dion, I know Cornelius, I don't know Miss Brand, I wish I did, she's amazing. Um, I wanted to really honor them and that they really set a structure. They, I won't read them either, but they both referred to blue or blues. And so I just thought they were perfect to set a, a basis for what was to come afterwards. Yeah, it most definitely does with this book because it does, it flows, it reads. It's like a good um, prologue to the book itself. I think it's fantastically done ideas in both the quotes. Now, the first poem I want to talk about this book is the first poem, actually. Oddly enough. Yes. <laughs> now, Blue Night with Scissors. Now, I really liked the particular use of the bracketed part of the poem near the top of it, where you put, I can't look at you, dash, or, comma, no dash, the novel line, I don't want to look. Now, first of all, tell us about where this poem came from and what made you want to use the brackets like that? Uh, this poem was a lot of fun to write. It was influenced by a book of, of poems of Federico Garcia Lorca, translated by Sarah Arvio, I believe is how she pronounces her last name. And you'll notice throughout the book that I write a number of centos or centos, which are merely poems that rely on the work of others to create, and, and their lines, in fact, to create a new poem. And sometimes the lines are modified, but I do give credit to whoever's work I'm relying on in that fashion. And so this book, uh, this poem rather really came from reading those wonderful poems of Lorca's who is a giant among poets for me. And um, I really wanted to pay homage to him via her translations. With respect to your, and so, so let me say a little about the process. If I'm planning to do that kind of work, I'll write down maybe 20 lines at random just literally pull the lines out because I liked the lines, how they sounded or the meaning behind them or both. And I'll just put them out, pull them out at, at random. I'll pick one to be the opening line and then let the poem come from there. But um, I was also trying to make a point about the speaker saying, not only can't I look at the world, I don't really want to look and acknowledging that we as humans often shy away from the difficult that is surrounding us and, and don't meet it head on. So I wanted to have a bit of a confession to start out the book. I, I can't look at you, but the truth really is I, I don't wanna look, right? And so I, I wanted that to be um, an admission from the beginning that it's difficult to deal with some of these issues. Yeah, and I got that on this poem straight away. It really is a powerful introduction to the book straight away with this. And yeah, and interesting enough, in some ways, I felt it like a false start, actually, because obviously the next poem in the book, The Conflict, com, Confluence of Women, there is, at least in the copy I've got, and I presume it's in the copy, your copy, there's a page gap, isn't there? So it's almost like yes. it's a prologue of a prologue. So yes. I presume what I know you, Lynn's work, that'll be on purpose, that. Oh, it was definitely intentional. That So you have the, the um, epigraphs in the beginning, mm. then you have the somewhat of a standalone poem where there's a bit of a yin and yang going on and you take a breath before you dive into the rest of it. It was really awesome. the way I was Thinking yeah, of it in I thought so straight away. I got when I was reading the book, I got to use the way you think and the way you organize things. Is good writing with poetry, and yours is this is a fantastic example. Not, not, I'm not even been honest in this one. As you can tell when you're reading the book, what everything's done for a purpose sometimes. So now obviously a confluence of women was wrote for Ida Perry. Now I presume yeah. this is the German actress we're talking about here, isn't it? It is not the German oh, actress we're talking about. Oh, oh. It is my 
I did <laughs> see Ooh. that's that's why you know no surprise for the writer no surprise for the reader um Ida Perry was our great aunt ah. who brought my mother to America as a child and she really functioned in the role of grandmother to those of us in the states our actual grandmother lived all of her life on Beckway, the island of Beckway in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So, and they were sisters, but Ida was really a ferocious woman in her own right. And this is where there's a connection to the prior books because in the first book, in the back of the book, there is a picture of Ida, probably in the late thirties, early forties. And she's standing next to an airplane, immaculately dressed with the ah. coat and the hat, whatever. And I asked my mom, I said, what was the story with this? And she said, oh, she learned how to fly a plane, which is pretty extraordinary for a black woman at that time in America. But of course, Bessie Coleman had popularized flying and I suspect I don't know if it's true. I suspect my aunt thought, yeah, I want to do that. She, she was a formidable person. She marched with the Women's League for Peace and Freedom in the 20s. She, she just was amazing. So I really wanted to set this up with a poem dedicated to her memory and the, the uh, ferociousness is all I can think of, the word I can think of that she instilled in me, even as a young girl. Brilliant. So not the yeah. <laughs> actor. No, I'm saying I'm the first time I get things wrong with this, but no, because I read no, up, no, no. up on the actress and I thought she sounded like a tremendous lady anyway. So it's just a different yeah. sort of tremendous lady. Absolutely. That's why. So that's why. So in your next book, you'd have to write one about the German actress then, right? <laughs> yes. Now that I know that, I'm so excited. Yes, I will definitely have to work on that. Okay, yes. On to the next piece I want to talk about is... Um, a rage on, and you I've completely botched this up already in the pronunciation pre recording. So, I'll right, let you, yeah. right. It is a rage on Bear Beast, 1763. Yeah. And Bear Beast is the part of South America that we now know as Guyana. And this, again, like the first poem you cited, was inspired by a book about the um, rebellion among the enslaved community in Berbice. And I created this poem from one sentence in the book that acknowledges that though they are not named and thought of as leaders, that women were instrumental in leading this rebellion and contributing in any way that they could to this rebellion that lasted over a year. So I wanted to highlight those women of saying, okay, we think of the men marching off doing whatever, but the fact is the women were there fighting alongside them as well. Yeah, it's a tremendous, I knew straight away when I was reading this, I knew it had to be based on some kind of true story because they, the host, you have to feel for it absolutely spot on because it's a powerful, powerful piece of it straight away. And it was like, you used a lot of like, the repetition that worked really well in this piece is before all the time, apart from the yes. one line, which I thought was brilliant. And I've wrote this down wrong with all oh, she's no help. <laughs> I was the fort, <laughs> and whatever that word was, it meant to be, and it was, I wrote down wrong, I just realised, I was a fort, wrong word, and abandoned before. What made you want to break the form with that one line? I think as a reader... Um, and, and there are probably discussions on both sides of this argument among poets and readers for that matter, that the use of the anaphora of before sets up a certain kind of rhythm, but you wanna break up that rhythm at some point so that you don't lose the reader's attention. At some point, the reader's brain is saying, or the listener's brain is saying, Oh, I know what's coming. I know what's coming. I know what's coming. So you want to shake up that expectation, I think, a little bit so that you don't lose the rhythm and you're still within the narrative, if that's what you're what you're uh, trying to convey. But you want to keep the reader and the listener on their toes and say, oh, I thought I knew what was coming, but something else came instead. Yeah. And, and so now I have to listen closely because I don't know if the poet's going to go somewhere else or going to revert 
to what they were doing before. So that was the reason for the change. There. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great philosophy indeed. It's like sometimes you do a song, you do like um, a break in it, aren't you, to the chorus dance thing, just to change it around. Yeah, absolutely. It works fantastically. Really, one of my favorite pieces in the book it was, and I loved that bit. So now, That's great. The next piece I want to talk about is. I think it's probably the most abstract piece in the book, this one. <laughs> but again, it's fantastic. And uh, should we tell people the title then? Tell why, tell them why I like this one so much. I would like to hear that from you, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm going to go. Another time I love to make another fool of myself now. An Untamed no. Rebel resists Octavia's Arnold poem, Sontan, consisting of 14 lines each, a certain. Oh, no, I wrote it down. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's Spanish, isn't it? <laughs> on Soyo. Yes. yes. It's Yo Soyo Un Hombro Centran Sendarano or something. So now, yep. if, if people are wondering, that's the poem. No, no more. <laughs> right. Now, and I, I'm going to read it over to just a little bit so that your listeners hear it in my voice. Yeah, please. An, do. Untamed, <laughs> an untamed rebel resists Octavio Armand's poem. Sonetto, consisting of 14 lines, each asserting, yo soy un hombre sincero. That's the way you I am it, man, is, Yeah, I am an honest man is the translation of that Spanish phrase. Right. We have to ask, because I've said 40 then. This is, that's the, the title and it's also the poem. And I've only ever seen that done probably once before. In any, and this is 40 years of reading poetry. And I loved it. So, and there's lots of dictation, little notes on this, so that could take forever to go in through. But tell us about where this came from as an idea for a poem. So this was uh, the, the compilation of a, of a couple of things. And no, and this is in no particular order. Um, I was in a workshop with a wonderful poet here, David St. John, who suggested that poets working in translation really can stretch their art if they really work on it, focus on it or whatever. I do not speak Spanish, but I had just purchased a book called 20th Century Latin American Poets. I believe that's the title. And this poem of Octavio Armand's was in there. It is a sonnet, he calls it sonetto in Spanish, but it is a sonnet, which is traditionally 14 lines. And in that poem, every line was, yo soy un hombre sincero, I am an honest man. Like I'm, I keep repeating it so you believe it, right? And so I started thinking about how do you translate something when every line is the same? So that was one thought I had. In the meantime, we have a, a, a series here, and maybe you have something similar in Britain called Best American Poetry of Whatever Particular Year. And I always get that book, not just for the poems, but historically, the, most of the authors who are selected for this will write a little paragraph about what they were doing with the poems. I can't find that poem, but what I remembered in my head was that structurally it looked like this one on the page. There was a title, there was white space, and then there was text at the bottom. I don't think that that text was footnoting the title, but because I couldn't remember what it was doing, I decided that I would footnote the title and the translation of Yo Soy Un Hombre Sincero would be in the footnotes. So you really have this title, which is a poem in and of itself, one could say. And then you have another poem that's in the footnote, giving each word that's footnoted a particular resonance. So that, that was, I love to play word puzzle games. And that was how the structure of this came about. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I might have made a complete botch pronouncing it, but that's me for you. But yeah, I can don't, I, don't worry. I about probably it. won't be the only one to recommend that either. <laughs> I, I will tell you that there is a poem in this book that refers to the indigenous indigenous name of a mountain here in California. 
Mount Shasta is very well known in the States, but that was not its original name. And I used the original name in the poem. I never read the poem in public because I can't pronounce it for the love of me. And I don't want to butcher it. And I don't want to insult. Uh, uh, I, I forget which uh, indigenous nation that name comes from, but I don't want to insult them by butchering that, even though I've heard it pronounced. Every time I get to it, I start to stumble. So that that happens sometimes in poetry. Yeah, it's true. No, it's true. It's true, true, true. So, yeah, I agree. Now, moving right on anyway. Yes, okay. On to well, a, a very different poem next. And this is a lot slighter, this poem. I felt with a much more fragmented nature. I loved it. I like this sort of piece. Is that Melaconia, a draft. Now, and I loved the fact that you called it a draft, but I didn't think it was a draft. <laughs> so I'd like to know more about this piece and why did you call it a draft? You know, I, I thought, I, I'm not sure I spent a lot of time thinking about it other than I had written this poem in another version earlier. And so when I got to the version that's in the book, I thought, well, this could still be a draft. Maybe it should be something else. Again, it's a cento or cento of the work of Carl Phillips. And so that idea coupled with wanting to convey at some point in the book that all of this is a work in progress. It's all, we're living a draft, even though at the same time we're living that our actions have a certain finality and impact. So I was trying to convey those two things, but I have to be honest and say, sometimes you just get an inspiration and you're not quite sure, but it seems to fit, so you go with it. You, you trust your gut on it. And that's what I did with this. Yeah, no, I agree. That's no, fair play, fair play. No, it's... It's a brave move, and I like—I love it for that reason, Tom. So I agree. Okay, thank you. A much more personal poem next is "Swallows," and obviously this is—I don't want to give too much away in this one because it's—it is clearly and because it's, all your poems are personal, but this one I think is much more direct. We're talking about obviously about when your neighbours is obviously just told us that the husband's passed away, and I found it interesting because there's a lot of man-made objects in this poem and you've called the poem swallows which is very nature-like imagery which obviously is a contrast I want, to, I want you to first of all learning why and then more about your mother's quote which won't, we won't repeat at the end of the poem yes yes um th this poem I remember thinking I, I and I can't remember what the news report or story was but it was something that made me think and it was about the time of year that the swallows returned to San Juan Capistrano here in in California which is usually about March and we say the swallows have flown back to Capistrano as though that's always what happens or, or as though that's not that it's always what happens it does happen yearly, at least so far, knock on wood with climate change, but um, they're not the same birds. They're different birds, but we're thinking, oh, the swallows came back. And I was kind of starting to obsess about this idea of the repetition of things in life, but are they ever really a repeat? And so I was going off on tangents with, with different ideas of how something happens, I think I say in here, uh, the chicken wing I savored once now tastes tasteless. Well, it's theoretically the same recipe, but you've changed as a person. So how you tasted it when you were 20 is not how you taste it when you're 40. So I was trying to go through those ideas. And then, as I like to say often of my mom, she will appear in a poem without being bidden to enter, but she enters anyway. And I've learned to, to trust that 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 inspiration of someone who obviously I grew up with all my life um, is part of this whole cycle. And so I learned to trust when something that isn't inspiration per se, but just wants says, I wanna be in the poem, I have something to say. I've learned to trust that. 
I've learned to trust them. Yeah, no, no, okay. I think it's a, there always is a trust in your work anyway. Yeah, I think it, yeah, I get straight away. I agree with you on that one. Now, my wife's favorite piece in this book, because she's massively interested in AI, because she's always attacking it in all of her non fiction work, as well as a lot of her poetry and stories, is dread in the shape of AI. Because this, again, is quite a different piece to a lot in your book, but I think it can hold, they all hold well together. And it felt like to me, and that's why I want to learn more about this, it felt like it was like a fever dream of some kind. And it was like almost like a sci-fi horror story in the poetry. Tell us about this piece. Yes, you, you have it just about right. First of all, again, it relies on AI's book, Dread, and lines from that book. But this may be the oldest poem in the book because it was written within a few years after 9-11. And I can still feel as I sit here and talk, you, talk to you today, the shock. I didn't see the plane hit the first tower. It was early in the morning here in Los Angeles, but I had the television on and turned up the sound just in time to see the plane hit the second tower. And I can still feel all these years later, the shock of it, the, the, you know, you don't know, is it an accident? Is it, I, I don't think I thought of terror in any way at that moment, but just how is this possible? And then to watch the towers fall, I think is one of those things that it, it will be with you all your life. Even if you, you weren't there in New York, but we all witnessed it on television. And I did. I did, yeah. um, so this, this poem it was something of a fever dream and came out of the recurring shock of that. And I happened to be reading this book at the time. And when I got to that line of hers, I watched the Trade Center Towers, which had been before 9-11, but fit because it was a precursor in many ways to what happened on 9-11. I just thought it was perfect, and I just had to figure out a way to use it. Yeah, no, understandable. I didn't actually get the 9-11 reference. I got it. It was a nightmare. So, yeah, it makes sense to me straight away when you explained it. Yeah, it's a really great piece. Yeah. Was, okay, was, we've, yeah. got, we've got another couple I want to touch on here, Sandy, before we go on to the second part today anyway. Now, another one of the more experimental poems here was Our Ancestors Enslaved Once to Jundali Would Never Be, which is a great title again. You, you've got so many great titles in this book, Lynn. That's what's really good with poetry books sometimes. You get a good title, it stands well, out. I love that because I consider myself the title challenge, so I love that. And actually, the reference is Juneteenth. Oh, June which 10th. has become a national, yes, a so national holiday here. No, no worries. Um, a national holiday here in the States, which I have conflicting feelings about because Juneteenth was a day or, or, or the holiday represents the time when the enslaved people in Texas were finally told two years after the end of the civil year, the civil war, that they actually, there had been an emancipation proclamation, they were no longer enslaved, but it was two years later. So there's a part of me that says, why are we celebrating that they had two additional years of enslavement that we should be angry about that? So I, I have mixed feelings about Juneteenth. I, I think it's important and it's interesting. I just came across an article that I saved that someone is talking about that. So I'm anxious to go, go to that article and see what this person's opinion is. But um, it was a way of kind of weighing against that, oh, now we have this holiday and everything's fine. And I'm, I'm naming off people that have been murdered. I'm naming off people that have fought for civil rights. I'm naming off places where um, uh, riots broke out. Um, I, I'm, I'm naming ships, uh, ships that carried enslaved Africans to this country. I'm naming African countries as a way of counterbalancing the idea that Juneteenth is a holiday. And that's yeah. why I say at the 
we will celebrate however it is we choose to, because for some of us, we're looking at it quite differently than others. So yeah, I'm so glad you like it. It's a great piece. Because people wonder if you look at the piece, it's split into two voices throughout the piece. Because there's a lot, there's big chunks and obviously like you've got the use of my name on the right, and then the yes. other side of the page you've got they said, yeah. And it, I got yes. that for me straight away. And I thought it's I love the way you did that because it's a very 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 clever structure to use. And you worked really really well. The next piece I'm going to ask you about, and I'm going to be careful our phrases with now in case this isn't who I think <laughs> it is. Right <laughs> now, the next piece yes. I want to ask about is Langston won't stay in his grave. Now, my initial reaction was, this is this about Langston Hughes? But obviously, after you told me before Correct. about your grant, I've oh, got that one right then. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You're still in the game, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about this one. Next. I, do, I do like Langston Hughes' poetry, actually. Well, I wanted to call Langston out in particular because my dad really, really loved the work of Langston Hughes and read it to me as a, as a girl. And when I'm writing these centos or centos, my philosophy of them is try to pick a poet, if you're doing a singular poet, try to pick a poet with a large body of work and don't look to the poems that they're most famous for. So for example, he has a poem, I Too Sing America. They use it in elementary schools, they use it all over. So, um, I wouldn't want to take lines from that because they're easily recognizable. So I'm taking some of the lesser known poems. And as I said before, I'll make a list maybe of 100 to 200 lines and then start picking lines out. And um, I realized I wanted to have a conversation with him. What would I, what would we talk about if Langston was sitting next to me? So then I started to shape it as a conversation between us where he's telling me that life is worth living until you're dead, you should be out there enjoying yourself, right? So that was how the poem really, really came to be. Yes, I got that straight away with that. I, do, I mean, when you look back at poets like Langston Hughes, and we have the same problem, I have the same problem with Philip Larkin over here, great poets yes. that they are, but I've got troubled relationships with them because of the way they were as people. And it's, yes. I, I understand completely about that one with Langston Hughes. He was, um, he's a polarising character, to put it nicely. A great poet, but I think he was a polarising character. So, now... He, I, wanna... I think he was... I'm sorry, go ahead. So I go, no, ladies, ladies first, go. <laughs> I, I, no, I was just going to say, I think he was polarising in some camps, including poetry and then in terms of the rest of his life. But since I came to it through my father... And, you know, anything dad said, I'm, I'm listening carefully. And so I didn't have that um, challenge in relying on his work. But I will tell you that I agree with that. You named Philip Larkin. The other one for me, who was probably early on someone who made me feel when I read his poems, I'll have what he's having, was Pablo Neruda. Oh, yeah. Oh, Pablo yeah. Neruda, an, yeah. an amazing, an amazing poet but as we know he wasn't a perfect human and so that's a bit of a challenge but i i am constantly drawn to neruda's work and and recognizing as for all of us in varying degrees there's the good and there's the not so good and sometimes the really really bad um so yes i think some some of these poets like they say do don't meet your heroes because you'll be disappointed um, and certainly Neruda is like for me. Yeah. I'm not going to name some of my favourite poets. Um, I've got, I know about a couple of really famous ones as we musicians. And yes. one of them, well, again, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what is off mic, not in person. Right here, certainly, but everyone's been telling me at the time that don't get to know your heroes. You'd be disappointed by them. Yes. And I exactly. think I agree with that. So I agree. Now, the last poem yours I want to talk about today on this book is the longest one. And this way, I got a bit. I nearly got caught out with this one again. You're you're too clever under you, Lim. Your de dedications in this one is say hallelujah when you've dedicated it to Peach J. Harris. Now there is a visual artist called Peach J. Harris, and I don't think it's that that Peach J. Harris. I think it's Peach J. Harris, the poet laureate in 
in California, the Cold Poet Laureate from 2022 to 2024. You would be correct. You would be correct in that latter assumption. And Peter, who is a dear, dear friend, um, has established a, a project called the Black Man of Happiness. And he, his theory is that he doesn't want to just focus on all the tragedy and, and horrible things that have happened to black men. He also wants to find the joy in their existence. So he and I were doing a reading together and he read a praise poem. And I started thinking, well, I've never written a praise poem, why, why is that? And that was the genesis of this. And I wanted to kind of take it from the beginning, theoretically to where my life is today, going through my parents coming from the islands to my schooling, to becoming a woman, to my love for music, and finally ending up as I do by saying, praise this too short life, because it's got its ups, its downs, it's good, it's bad. But at the end of the day, Aren't we glad we're living it? And I didn't, there, there's so much in the book that is maybe a downer that I wanted to end on a, on a positive note, an uplifting note. That was the goal. Yeah, got it. Got it straight away. And it does, it's got that sort of hands up in the air moment. Like you, I wonder, I'm not using words preachings. It's not. It's celebration, right. holding your hands up to the world. Nick, yeah, I got it. Yeah, brilliant stuff. It's also a quite a long piece as well. Did this take quite a while for you to write this poem? Uh, yes, because as you say, it's a longer piece than most of my poems. I, I have a joke where one of my family members said, don't you have a novel in you? And I said, you know, I think not poems, 40 lines, you're in, you're out, you're done, right? Um, so most of my poems, I would say, are between 15 and 35 lines. They're not super long. This one was a little bit longer because I kind of got on a roll with it and started thinking about this and that and the other and don't forget to talk about this and all of that. So it, it said to me, I would like to be a little longer. Thank you very much. Would you give me some space to lay out on the page? And I said, yes, you can have as much space as you want. So that that is really why it's longer because I, I really did get on more of a role as I started thinking about the sort of things that were important to me. Yeah, I think always believers all of poetry is poems don't know when to behave sometimes. And I, yeah. I got I got at this poem straight away and I thought it's a great piece. I knew straight away it was that sort of piece, judging with the forms of the rest of it, you would have got thinking is say saying, no, I'm not going to be a short poem. You're going to have to work for me harder. I I, I get exactly. sometimes like that was tremendous. So now Obviously, that's all I want to ask you today about the book. But obviously, I think it's worth people knowing how long it took you to write this book, because it was a long, long book for you to write. It's a long book anyway. You told me it took about five years to get all this book together, didn't it? Yeah, I think in the main, the poems were written over the last five years. It is a longer book than any of my others. I was struggling what to put in and what to th th take out. There's a there's an old Oscar or, or, or a line attributed anyway to Oscar Wilde, where he said, oh, I worked so hard today. I this afternoon, this morning, I put a comma in and this afternoon I took it out or words to that effect. And so I kind of felt like that with selecting the poems for this collection. But it is a little bit longer. I would say roughly over five years, but I'm glad you reminded me about the AI poem because that definitely was written, I want to say 2005, somewhere in that time period, and just sat around for a while, wasn't in the prior three collections, it didn't seem to fit. And then when this book came along, I dusted it off and said, yes, I think this this will work well. Yeah, I think they call that something like it's um, a false head because the book I've accidentally written myself at the moment, I know that's got two poems in it that are about 10, 15 years old because they wouldn't fit in anything else before. So you could, you could then tell people, oh, it, it took ages to write this book, and even if it, most of it didn't. <laughs> so. Yeah, yes. And you, and, you, and you do have to learn to, to trust yourself that, I mean, for me, since I came to really concentrating on poetry a little later in life, I was a little anxious, like, oh, I should put every poem I have in the book. No, 
not every poem is going to fit. So you really have to discipline yourself and hopefully have a good editor that says, you know, I'm not sure about this poem yeah, for this I'm, book. I'm always pinning all the books I've done have been relatively short books so far. Because I'm definitely pinning with poetry, less is more. And that's yes. why this yeah. book is a longer book, but it's still it's still less is more. Because I've got the I got the feeling you're probably gonna put us twice as many poems in it, but I think it could have diluted it. So yeah, you've done the right thing with it straight away, I agree. So yeah. Anyway then, okay. On to the wrap-up questions. I wanted I wanted to let people hear a few poems because we've we've gone on for a while. <laughs> so, so, absolutely I do that. It's been, it's been good stuff. So okay. What do you have planned next then for yourself for your creativity? So I do have a book noodling around in my mind that would be built around a basic question of what is it that we as humans keep and what do we discard? And it started when I first started thinking about it as physical structures. So Los Angeles is infamous for tearing, I said this in a poem in the first book, tearing stuff down to build something newer, which isn't always better. And we lose something when we tear that, tear something down like that. But the, but the idea of it has broadened into other areas as well. What do we keep? What do we discard? Who makes the decision and why, right? So for example, I should get over it, I know. But when I came home from college, my mother had thrown out some things of mine. And I like to keep everything. She didn't like to keep anything. And she made that decision without consulting me because she knew I'd boohoo over it. So that, that question of whether it's a building, whether it's a relationship, whatever it is, we as humans keep certain things forever and other things we think not so much, we don't need those. And so I wanna explore that question in a bigger way and in a global way. And in the middle of it, I think structurally, I also want to talk about, I'm an adoptee and I can trace my roots on my birth side to Madagascar. And some of those stories have been lost for reasons that are obvious, some reasons not so obvious. And some of those stories have been kept. And so I, I'm thinking now I can have a personal portion of the book around these bigger public questions so I, I haven't quite worked it out but that's that's kind of where I'm going with it yeah sounds sound like you got it in fault anyway so that's always a good start anyway straight away so not like an accidental book which sometimes it, it's just a form of different way so brilliant right okay right. this would be more intentional I think than anything I've written thus far good good little bit definitely so okay let's have the hard sell and wrap up with where can people get hold of you for books to date well, I have to say, I am so excited because Boa Editions that published Blue on a Blue Palette also published it in England. So it can be found on Amazon UK, which I am just over the moon about, very excited. But I guess any Amazon platform, it's available, um, as well as uh, I have a website, lynnthompsononeword.us. And anyone who wants to read some of my work that's not in the book, that's on other platforms or find out um, what I'm doing, what events I'm attending, they can certainly go to that website. Um, and sometimes, you know, for poets that I like that I may not have their book, you just Google a name. Maybe you read one of their, their poems um, somewhere and you think, oh, I wanna know more about this poet. So I, I check my Google regularly. I, what I have noticed, there's a soccer mom who has written books. That's not me. I'm the poet. So, uh, I saw Lynn that. Thompson I saw that. Yeah, I did see that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, I think that's interesting. So, um, uh, yes, those would, but I would say Amazon. Also, I don't know if this is international. There's an organization like Amazon, but better, in my opinion, called bookshop.org. And the reason that so many writers like them is because they will give a portion of their sales to independent bookstores. And we all know how important the independent bookstores 
are. Thank God for Amazon. Yes, they they do their thing, but also we love our local independent bookstores. So <clears throat> you as the purchaser can can no, you as the person having your books, or maybe even as the purchaser, can designate where you want this little extra money. It's not a lot of money, but every little bit helps where you want this money to go to. So that's that's a really good feature of bookshop.org. Fantastic. Okay, we'll wrap up part one here, Linda. I want to give you a chance to take a quick glass of water. <laughs> and then Thank we'll be you. right back to two shakes of the dice. With Lynn's going to do several poems for us. I've really enjoyed this today, Lynn. It's always, it's always, I always enjoy them anyway, but yeah. This has been fantastic. And I, I'll read the first two. And if we have time for a third, I'll read that. Yeah, we'll let you take a quick break for a second. And then we'll be right back to everybody. In two shakes of the dice. Spoken man. Hey guys, at the end, spoken name, Lynn Thompson, my friend. Lynn's going to read out three poems for us now, none of which we've discussed in part one. So this might, this, I'm looking forward to this. Over to you, Lynn. Thank you. This first piece is entitled, A Birth Mother Wears a Costume Her Daughter Will Never Fit Into. Some thought the mother said, taproot. Some thought that woman said resigned, but her daughter mouthed immaculately conceived. Some thought the mother said perdition. Some thought she said hocus pocus, while her daughter wrote parables, wrote charms. Some hoped the daughter would say, yes, mummy, although they suspected the daughter said wishbone, knew she would deny everything slipping into, out of. Some never understood her need to be alone, her fear of sorcery. They only knew her as braid of ginger and sea salt, as weightless darling and origami. Some have heard her bark and bark and bark. Some have heard her arrange a resistance. Fantastic. Oh, what a good piece, that one. Indeed. Now, I'm not in, I've got a few comments about some of the structure in this, but first of all, then, I, I don't want to know if you've got a daughter, to be honest with you. That's why I'm going to be very careful. I say, oh, you're talking about your <laughs> mother. So tell us about where this poem came from. And I've got a couple of points I want to raise about it anyway. <laughs> Yes. So I think I mentioned before that I'm, I'm an adoptee. So I'm frequently writing about either the birth mother or the mother of choice who chose me as her daughter. But, but really, this poem is about a certain amount of chafing between many daughters and their mothers. The, the daughter is fighting to assert her independence. The mother has a vision for what she thinks her daughter should be. So I was really speaking to that, as well as the closing in the context of the book, where this daughter, like so many daughters, is arranging a resistance, not only to the mother, but to the circumstances of the world that she's living in. So that was the genesis of the piece. Yeah, it's got that. I got that. As it's just after you've catching me out here, I'm being very careful. So the comments I've been offering tonight, then, <laughs> yeah, okay. On the line, knew she would deny everything, slipping into, out of. I love the fact you just done one bracket there, so but not the complete bracket. So why did you do that? Uh, well, there is in in I don't know in your copy the bracket starts with the line before, although she ah, suspected, yeah, that, although yeah, they suspected it. the dark. Yes. Got it. Yeah, sorry, yes. my fault. Yeah, apologies. Yeah, yeah it's just it's no, still no, got no about three lines. So, yeah, it's the way you formatted it. It's quite interesting. Okay, yeah. Tell us about that point then, where you put the brackets in then. I, I think that the use of a parenthetical on the page is always of interest to the reader because they're thinking, is this an aside or isn't this part of the basic story? And I think here I was using it as an aside that now you have, even though we've been saying some thought this, some thought that, they suspected is, a, is another chorus of voices, if you will, saying, I suspect this girl said wishbone, and I, I know she's going to deny everything that we think, right? And she's going to slip into and slip out of the story. 
So I wanted to make it a, a point of uh, additional thought and, and pondering for the reader at this section. The listener won't hear it, obviously, as a parenthetical, because I don't read it that way, I don't think. But I just thought it was an interesting touch for the reader on the page. Yeah, no, I've got you straight now. Great stuff indeed. I've really enjoyed that. So definitely a really good stuff. Really, really good poem. So okay, let's move on then. On to poem number two. This one again is celebrating my love for fellow poets, in this case, the poet Linda Gregerson. Variations on lines by Linda Gregerson. Like the woman so fallen out of practice, she can no longer. And the important point here is practice. For a woman without practice cannot unbuckle, forsake the grim, or shake the shadows. Or maybe the point is can no longer, as in can no longer be a pigeon, a snare with no place in the band. To be like a woman is to be becoming, ever spun around the motto on an unguided path, open-throated, release, and a fever. That is a fantastic piece. Again, I love the ending of that one there. The ending is really, really powerful. Now, I've actually heard of this poem before. I studied this lady at university a few years ago, right? So how did you first come aware of the work of Linda Gregerson? So th I had to refer to my notes because I forgot the um, the exact poem that I used. And it was uh, from her poem, Variations on a Phrase by Karmic McCarthy. McCarthy. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So I oh. wanted to do what she did in using a phrase of his by using a phrase of hers and really trying to parse the meaning of it. Yeah. So this, this is the way that poets influence one another. You read okay. any one of a million billion poets and you think, wow, I'd like to do something like that, but I want to make it my own. So uh, by hers variations on a phrase, I said, I mine will be variation on lines. So for the reader, for hopefully those in your audience who will purchase the book, the first three, it's written in tersets, three lines, and the first three lines are a quote from Linda, Linda Gregerson's poem. And then I try to parse in my head what I think she's saying or how I'm taking it in. And that's the genesis of the poem. Yeah, it's a cracking piece. So I just, I said 40, I love the bit about the motto on an unguided, unguided path. That's brilliant. What, what an image. And then like it's open throat and release it. It's like a fever. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's an absolute superb piece. That. Very, very. Oh, um, good. The sound of it is very soft as well. And it's it's one that deserves to be reread several times. So oh, brilliant stuff. Okay. Time for the. Well, I'm glad you said soft. Yeah. I'm glad you said soft because so often I feel like my poems are saying, you know, bang, 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 bang. So I'm always looking for opportunities to be a little softer. Yeah, you've got you've got a lot of tone in this book because, like I said, there's number we've talked about. Quite, and I hate this word. I can't. I can't think of a way of saying it. The louder pieces that are designed for shouting from the rooftops, but then yes. like this one's, I think it's whis. It's like a solitary whisper, and that's always good. Good of different voice, and I, I think it's excellent. Really, is good stuff. This one. Okay, let's go for the big finale then. Right, <laughs> we'll go for the big finale with Lost Sonata. Tonight I am as tippery as I've ever been, as I hear the star's contrived sonata in a firmament with its color constantly ebbing. I am as naked as the imbalance of an electrical charge. Or I am swimming along the ruined coastline of Guinea-Bissau, where I am no more lost than in my own living room. My lovers ask a trick question. And then they ask me again, babbling, daily, differently, like every percussive instrument, like a calabash, like a cora. It doesn't matter. Everything is imitation. Everything is almost what it's meant to be. 
my mud of a mind making paper mache out of all that's unextraordinary. And by now, dear reader, you are as confused as anyone. With that, know this. Tonight, I'm tippery among fireflies, my unlovers' palms circling my want. I really like the change in pace halfway through this piece. I think it's very, very clever done indeed. Where well, you've gone on about like a carabash, like a chorus, then a lot of other poets I know would have actually moved to another stanza then, but you didn't. You've used the same breath just to change gears, but then say like it doesn't matter. Everything is imitation, but yes, <laughs> absolutely brilliant stuff. Yeah. Now, okay, tell Thank us about you. where the idea of this poem came from then. I think if I go back and look at early drafts, this poem was going in a completely different direction and it wasn't working. I, I can't even tell you what I thought I thought it meant. At the same time, I came across uh, an envelope of some older poems and I thought, let's just try seeing what we can use, what lines are interesting because as I wrote it and worked on it more, I realized I don't get the world at all. I don't know what's going on. I'm as, as confused in my living room as if I was in some other country. The familiar isn't any more understandable than the unfamiliar. And so once I that idea took root, then I was more intentional about the lines. I was stealing from myself, basically from old drafts to put in there, to give it a sense of no sense at all. So I wanted, I wanted it to be a logical illogic um, because that was how I was feeling about the world at the time that I'm very much a person as a trained lawyer that likes A, B, C, but the world is not A, B, C. It's, it's all over the place and you don't get it. So that's what I was trying to capture with this, the lost music, the lost sonata. So. Fantastic. Yeah, it does, because there's a lot, again, I, what I love with your poems is there's the movement in it and the mood. It's like you're doing like classical mood movements to me sometimes. That's That one's like it's an, like a piece of Mozart, but it changes gears halfway through one of his big one of his big crescendos just trying to catch you out. And yeah, got it. Absolutely loved it. Tremendous stuff. Absolutely. I love, I love your, I love your saying that because uh, in the first book, the question was from the publisher was, was there enough formality in the poems? And I, the light went off in my head and I said to her, you, paraphrasing what you just said, I said, you're listening to Mozart and I'm listening to Miles Davis. And so it's not going to sound formalistically, perhaps like other poems. In fact, I hope it doesn't because I'm trying to capture in musical terms, what what Miles Davis was trying to capture with jazz, so that yeah. that sometimes it does sound a little off, but that's intentional. Yeah, got it straight away. I think it's it's harder sort of, sort of thing to make it when it's off. You can tell when the writers know what they're doing. As with Miles Davis, definitely, and it's some some Mozart stuff as well. It's because yes. so cleverly done. If you're looking back at it, thinking. You might have thought, instead of thought, the writer, the writer made a mistake here, but a second time or a second listen, you realise they haven't. And that's what I love. That's probably what I like about this book, actually, the cleverness in it. And you could tell, like, it took you five years to write it, definitely. <laughs> so, respect you, Ellen. Thank you so, so much. That's it, unfortunately, and all my questions today. So, I want to thank you again today. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed this past hour or so we've been chatting today. It's been absolutely great to go and do a deep dive in a book that I suspect well, I'm, I'm going to go back to again a few times as well. <laughs> it's been wonderful speaking with you as well, Andy. And I, as I said, um, when we were off air, I have downloaded your podcast and I'm anxious to listen to some of your episodes and I'm going to share them with my friends and say, let's go across the pond and see what they're doing over there. So thank you so much for having me. Yeah, indeed. Hang around anyways. We'll go to each quick words off the microphone anyway. But it's been a really, really good desk for episode today. So I've fully enjoyed it. So anyway, guys and girls, yeah, that's it for today. So 
as Don Callis over at AW Wrestling says, stay safe and stay over. Of course. See you all next time. Spoken, mate.